Yes, I am on. Thank you, John. Thank you, Cray. Thank you guys for joining me today. I told you this story of bears repeating. 50 years, not quite, uh, 49 and a half years ago now, I landed in Vietnam. And as corpsmen, as kind of nurses, um, trained in emergency medicine, we went to a little uh, a dispensary and we got a bottle about yay size of a pink or white, any of you in the military, old people like me, would remember this. And we were instructed to make certain, you see each corpsman is responsible, I forget how many, a platoon, you know, hundreds of Marines. We were their medical care. Uh, and these guys were tough and they were fighters and they were wonderful. Let me give you an analogy. I firmly believe our doctors, nurses, lab techs, x-ray techs, you know, they're heroes today. They never were, they went to work, they went home, and I've often said this, they work 50 patients a day. That could be eight hours, that could be 10 hours, 12 hours a day. It's almost a, a thankless career. I mean, you get home, you're exhausted, you sleep for a few hours, you get up and go again. Some of these doctors and nurses are now sleeping in the garage during this uh, COVID-19, so as not to infect their family. Had I not been through this, folks, had I not been through it 50 years ago for a year where you don't sleep, your heart is going 90 miles an hour, uh, you may contract the virus, you may be shot, it's pouring rain on you, we didn't have indoor air-conditioned hospitals. I've been through very much the same as what these doctors and nurses have been through. And do me a favor, high elbow them when you see them. Give them the elbow or the shoulder. Uh, they're doing a great, great job. I want to start today by telling you, this bottle we were given in Vietnam to give the Marines. You know, I'd go out, I replaced a corpsman who had been there for a year. So I went out and uh, there I'm landed in, in some rice paddy somewhere up in the Quezon Mountains with this bottle. The next day when I got up, you sleep on the ground. The next day I got up, I said, okay, I want all you guys to, you know, take one of these. Uh, it was quinine. It was quinine. Quinine sulfate, as I remember. And once a week or so, you'd have to take this to prevent malaria. Malaria could kill you. I know, I had it. I took all my quinine, and then I got malaria. And then for the rest of the 10 months, I didn't take quinine, and I never got malaria again. I had to wonder, how great is this pill? The Marines refused it, folks. They refused it because it gave them diarrhea. That wasn't the land of toilet paper, right? Similar circumstances, only not really today. Um, nobody out in the field, you know, with a shovel, wants diarrhea. And so that's the, the entree in my life to something called quinine, tonic water, vodka tonic, quinine. Okay, look at this. I made this little graph for you guys, and I hope you better understand this. Okay, the cinchona. This is a tree in Peru, right? It's a tree. The natives have used the bark of the cinchona tree for centuries to help with various medical conditions, including malaria, which it didn't for me, but apparently it does for them. Okay, so you hear this often on TV. I want to I wanna help you with this. Uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are 20th century man-made versions of cinchona bark. Okay, John, back to me. Folks, somebody came up in, in, you know, 1940 or 50 and said, this is ridiculous. We get this stuff free from, and it's not standardized, it's not regulated, there's no lot to lot, you know, number on it. So let's make a pill out of it, let's make a drug out of it. What's included in chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, we don't know. Hydroxy, maybe water, you know, but we don't know. And that has always scared me. Now they have to protect or defend their patent. Right? So this is proprietary information for the drug companies. But what about just getting some cinchona bark? You know, I wouldn't do that unless I was absolutely desperate. Uh, but I want you to know what everybody, all the networks are talking about. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are actually from the bark of a tree called the cinchona tree. And that's where you get quinine sulfate, tonic water. Okay? Okay, John. So chloroquinine and hydroxychloroquinine uh, have efficacy against fungal infection, says, see at the bottom, clinical investigations, 2013. Chloroquinine has been shown to be potentially beneficial for treatment of autoimmune diseases, inflammatory diseases like lupus, arthritis, sarcoidosis. As of May 
uh, thir uh, 2013, 33 clinical trials using chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine in cancer were active or were currently being recruited. Do you see where I'm going with this? Folks, I have published that I believe in some cases, in many cases, cancer is actually fungal based. And here's where I want to go right now. I want to read you a seven-year-old blog around the time SARS came out. I blogged this. It's on my website. Any of you can grab it and read it. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you verbatim what I wrote. AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. They are related conditions. The African diet is rich in corn and peanuts. Corn and peanuts are often infected with aspergillus mold. Aspergillus mold makes a poison called aflatoxin. It's a mycotoxin. Two tubes of blood are drawn from each of 314 African AIDS patients. One tube for each patient is tested for HIV. The other tube is tested for aflatoxin, the mold. Positive HIV results are then tested for their viral load, which varies depending on how much HIV is in your body or in your bloodstream. Here's the results. The higher the mold count was in the blood, the higher the HIV viral load was. If this doesn't prove a fungal etiology, what I said in this was, we're calling it HIV, human immunovirus. Is it HIF? Do you believe that? The results, the higher the mold count was in their HIV blood, the higher the HIV was. So the more mold, 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 yeah, you got HIV, this is really bad. The reason this study came up was because maize or corn is really the staple diet. Corn, peanuts, etc., ground nuts, the staple diet in Africa. In Africa, we see huge numbers of what we call hepatocellular cancer, okay, HCC. This aflatoxin causes, in humans, don't ever let a doctor tell you, mold does not cause cancer. Well documented for decades. Aspergillus mold, one of the most common, penicillin, candida, uh, aspergillus, uh, fusarium, very, very common molds that we get in touch with through, through our food, through our air, etc. <clears throat> but aspergillus mold makes a, a very, very potent poisonous byproduct called aflatoxin. We give it to bunnies when we want to test cancer drugs, and they all get cancer. So you know aflatoxin gives humans hepatocellular cancer. So I thought, and, and here's another take home. Diflucan came out in the 1980s. Diflucan is called fluconazole. It's a bloodstream antifungal. It followed on the footsteps of amphotericin B and other older generation, nizorol, older generation uh, antifungals, but it wasn't quite as toxic. It seems that diflucan dissolves in the bloodstream before it filters entirely uh, through the liver. So uh, diflucan came on the market just to treat AIDS patients. Tell me there's not a fungal component to HIV. Now let's go back and study this virus. Is it time we begin looking at it? Here's where I'm lost. And I'm, uh, you know, I'd like to be more of a conspiracy theorist than I am. But I read in the paper the other day, some newspaper, oh, I know which newspaper, I read in the newspaper that this stuff sits on a table, this virus, if we, if it's atomized, right? Ah, chew. It sits on a table for four hours. It'll sit on cardboard or paper for three hours. Uh, it can live on our skin for many hours. And I'm thinking, okay, why have we never done that with the flu every year? How long does this year's flu virus sit on a table? Well, we don't know. Why do we begin testing coronavirus for this? I find it just so fascinating, folks. I, I, I'm just, I, look, I'm sickened by the people whose lives this is taking, but I, and I'm really trying to understand it. Now, my conservative hat. I'm one of the few who think it's probably a pretty good idea to stay indoors. I, I gave you this analogy, and it probably wasn't a good one the other day, but ringworm is a transmittable fungal disease. 
you go up and you hug somebody with ringworm when you got it here, they're going to have it on their back. Okay? It's transmittable, not through your clothing, but skin on skin. So you quarantine each other. You, you separate. You don't touch, etc. And that's how we're trying, and it makes sense to me. This makes sense to me. If we quarantine, if we stay away for other people for, you know, the eight hours it grows on my skin or the ten hours it grows on paper or four hours, whatever it is, it makes sense that in a given period of time we're not going to sneeze or cough or cry on somebody and transmit uh, this virus from person to person. Another thing I wanted to tell you, uh, this is in regarding to AIDS. Pneumocystis pneumonia, PCP, pneumocystis pneumonia is a serious infection that we used to think was caused by a protozoa. Guess what? It's caused by the fungus Pneumocystis girovecchi, which used to be, it used to be carini, okay? Pneumocystis girovecchi used to be Pneumocystis carini. If you're my age, you remember carini. It was all over the newspapers in the 1980s. But I think this is so fascinating that years later I look up this protozoa, uh, Girovecchi, to see if that's at all involved in this corona thing, and it isn't, but it said, well, we changed our minds. It's no longer a protozoa. It's fungal. And I'm thinking, wow, are you kidding me? wonder how many other things are fungus. Now comes the HIV drugs. You've seen this on TV. Now comes the HIV drugs, uh, lop uh, lopinavir and something else. I can't pronounce it. These are antiviral medications that prevent immunodeficiency virus from multiplying in your body. Do you guys know what a retrovirus is? I used to think a retrovirus because uh, who's that guy, Dietrich Klinghart? And I had, had a great meeting. Uh, you talk about a deep man. He's an MD, PhD. We met in, uh, I was introduced by a couple of doctor friends to him because he saw my lecture and he told the boss over there, gee, that was an amazing lecture. Well, Dietrich Klinghart is a retroviral guy. Now, through all his lectures and everything, I used to think a retrovirus, when you think retro, old time, virus current, okay? So that's an old time virus that's laid dormant in your body for a long period of time, and now it's surfaced. You got old, your immune system went down, you're under a lot of stress, you're crying, you're divorcing, you're eating chocolate and booze all day. And, oh, by the by, did you see that booze sales are up 20 or 30 percent? Be careful, guys. Be careful. Don't come out in a month morbidly obese and have all sorts of health problems. Go with Doug here. I'll be with you a couple times a week, okay? Listen to this on retrovirus. HIV is a retrovirus, but I didn't know this. <clears throat> a retrovirus is a virus that is composed not of DNA, but RNA. Okay, we all knew that, right? Um, retroviruses have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase that gives them the unique property of transcribing their RNA into our DNA after it enters a cell. The retroviral DNA can then integrate into the chromosomal DNA of the host cell uh, where it's expressed. This I find fascinating. I've always wondered. I know that fungal mycotoxins mutate DNA. I don't know about RNA. And I've, you know me. You know me. You've been with me for quite a while now. You're having the same questions I am. I will wonder until I die, and I wish I had years to do these studies. I wonder if virus wasn't something we came up with in the 19... 18s, 1920, 22, when Viri came onto the market, <clears throat> because we couldn't get rid of fungi. We didn't know about mycotoxins in uh, 1920, 100 years ago now, <clears throat> but all of a sudden, there are books. There's one right there that I have uh, The Advance of the Fungi by Dr. E.C. Large. And in this, he said, he basically said, we couldn't fix anything. And so the name changed from mycotic or plant mycoses, uh, trees that were dying, weeds that were dying, well, grass that was dying. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Your tea's on its way. What is? Your tea is on its oh, way. Oh, I totally forgot about that. Thank you. Um, I left it on, by the way, my tea. Wow. 
but boy, did I have a workout just a few minutes ago. Um, where was I? Where was I? Come on, go with me. Where was I? Thank you, sir. Do you remember what I was saying right before you put that tea together? Yeah. What was my tea? I have ADD really bad today. Um, Retrovirite. <clears throat> This is fascinating in that there's no DNA, I believe, in a virus. It's RNA. Ribonucleic acid DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. And this converts these, these retroviruses because of reverse transcriptinase, changes the RNA somehow to DNA. Fungi mutate DNA. I've never looked up because I was fascinated with fungi, not viri. I've just got to wonder. They both depend on a human host. They both, paras ah, that's not true. Fungi can live as a saprophyte. It eats dead or decaying material, and it lives a happy life, eating trees when they fall down, leaves during the winter, and so forth. But fungi also parasitize man, unlike viruses. They need to live aboard us and get their little noses inside our cells and then in our DNA, by the way, just like mycotoxins and fungi. And they depend on us for sustenance, survival, et cetera, for their replication. I mean, I find it fascinating. When I see things, I, do you remember John Kennedy? <clears throat> One of his most famous sayings, if you guys are the era that I am in the 60s, one of his most famous sayings people tell me was, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That wasn't the one that hit me at 12 years old or 13 years old when he said, most people see things as they are and ask why, but I see things as they could be and ask why not. Wow, I still get goosebumps when I hear that. Why can't we put a man on the moon? Why can't we do this thing? Boy, he'd be blown away today, wouldn't he? Oh, that was a horrible thing to say. He, his, uh, his whole persona would change today watching what's happened in politics the last 50 years. Okay, so uh, I find all this fascinating. Sinchona Bark, okay, I'll go on with this on Thursday with you, but isn't that fascinating? Sinchona Bark, 1700s. Indians, natives, using it. They found out it could help them with malaria, but they found many other things. And now we have found it's being studied for cancer work, and it's being studied a potential anti-inflammatory and potential treatment for autoimmune diseases like lupus, arthritis, and sarcoidosis, and it comes from the bark of a tree. But man, of course, geniusly has stepped in and secretively made a drug out of it. So we can't know exactly what's in it. It's kind of like this upcoming vaccine. I'm going to go back to what I said a month ago. How are we going to know if this is a real problem or a perceived problem, a made-up problem? And I think the end result is if in a year, remember we were going to have a vaccine in two months, poof, it was going to appear. Now they're saying a year. If in one year that vaccine is mandated, do the math. There's 8 billion people on the earth times 40 bucks a shot. You only need one of those vaccines and then stimulate fear prior to it coming on the market so everybody will stand in line and get that shot. You only need one of those for a trillion dollars, okay? If the shot becomes like a flu shot, well, my doctor said take a flu shot, and I'm with you, okay, take a flu shot, uh, or not. You know, if you don't choose to take a flu shot, don't. If it becomes non-required, then I'm worried. I do not understand this corona or COVID-19. Here's the good news. I get to watch them nightly on TV, and they don't either. They don't either. The biggest question I have is where are we going with this? I think the answer to that is they're realizing when we isolate ourselves and be away from other people, we're not coughing, you know, sneezing around other people, um, it can go into a dormancy phase. So when we come out of this in a few weeks or a month, everything will get back to normal. I'm probably one of the rare, rare people. In media, of course, we can be out on the street. We can drive to work and back, don't go anywhere else. 
but drive to work and back. Um, and I'm not having a problem with this. I have planted some flowers. I have done things I would have never done. I'm reading more than I've ever read. I'm studying. I'm trying to figure this thing out. Let me read you, before I answer your question, something amazing. <clears throat> they took a bunch of mice. This is in Japan. It's called the uh, Metabolomic Analysis of SMP30 slash GNL knockout mice treated with fermented vegetable and fruit extract. And it was done just recently, published in a journal, a good journal, uh, ta -ta -ta, published in Functional Foods and Bioactive Compounds in the Management of Chronic Inflammation. Here we go again. Inflammation. Cinchona bark is an anti-inflammatory. They've made it into a couple of drugs that are being popularized right now. This is another anti-inflammatory. So I just want to tell you, they had a bunch of mice, and they knocked out their bodies, okay? But they kept them alive. A dietary supplement developed in Japan, OMX, is the result of extended fermentation of dozens of edible uh, vegetables and includes 12 strains of lactic acid bacteria and bifidobacteria. Uh, then they went on knockout mice, which lacked the ability to biosynthesize vitamin C in the body, were used in the study. And they, these poor mice, I think about these, because I, when I worked with Dr. Hughes at USC Medical School, as I was going up the stairs, the fourth or fifth floor, there on Big East Street it was called, had dogs, you know, it's just stuff, e even at a young age, I just didn't like to see cruelty to animals. I know we have to do studies, but it just seemed cruel to me. And you see mice, and, uh, it, you know, it, it was quite an amazing sight. Well, what they did with these mice is they didn't have the ability to utilize vitamin C, okay? And it goes on to say those uh, mice were kept under experimental conditions, yada, yada. Uh, so they lost weight. The mice began losing weight. Uh, they began uh, experimental conditions. Conclusion. The results showed that in the KO mice, the knockout mice, some organ damage had occurred during the vitamin C deficiency, as indicated by weight loss, hepatic, which is liver injury, and changes in triglyceride-related uh, markers. OMX, this Japanese formula, had an effect on energy charge maintenance by elevating total enzyme levels, including antioxidant capacity. Glutathione levels went up, and it tells all the good things that happen. Folks, I just want to, I, I bring, this is a brand new paper, hot off the press. And the reason I bring it to you is because I picked up the phone today. This sounds really familiar. And I called the president of the company. Look at our box here. John is all empty. We, we have ours. Um, thank you. This is Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. And at a time where we need these enzymes and we need good health and we need our glutathione and we need to thrive, I'm so glad. After reading papers like these, I'm so glad I take this. Sometimes I take stuff without fully understanding. John, you can have this back and I'll get into the questions. Can I have it? I'll give you... $400. It's like a roll of toilet paper, right? I'll give you a huge amount of money for it. Okay, so I want you to know for 15 or 16 years, I have been an advocate. This is a living bacteria, not a dead one you reconstitute in water. These are alive with a food supply in their microcosm, in their little homes. Billions of these good lactobacillus, acidophilus, and bifidobacteria. Oh, it's such a great, such a great company. Michael Shore, such a wonderful man. Okay, now I'm going to get to your questions. Let's see, John, I probably, here we go. I get so disheveled here with all these papers. So isn't that interesting? From the bark of a tree, from the bark of a tree, we're saving lives now. Only is it a bark of a tree, or have we made it different? Hmm. Okay. Bob says, Doug, John, and crew. Hi, Bob. 
Thank you for all your, your advice. What do you think about the new 5G implementing around the world? Do you think fungus can uh, feed, yeah, of electromagnetism? What about light and sound? I think blue-green stuff provide grooving on the positive side of batteries. Might be fungus. Wow, Bob, okay. Um, so there are, there are people who really study this, and I think they said that China was one of the first major countries up with 5G. That implants in my brain, Bob. Hmm. Coincidence then? And then they say, well, this is from what they eat. And uh, I heard a doctor on TV this morning saying, that's horrible. What they Folks, let them live their culture. They've done this for centuries. Let us live our culture. Don't condemn them for their culture. If you don't want to eat bats, don't. But don't condemn people in other countries for their culture. I think sometimes these doctors tend to outstep their knowledge, right? And I do too. We're all guilty of this, judging others. Don't judge lest ye be judged. Man, I don't want you guys judging me. Electromagnetic fields and a virus that's zipping across the globe. Um, yeah, there are studies that talk about the influence of EMFs, electromagnetic fields. Remember 10 years ago, Bob, it was a smart meter. They just came onto your lot, walked into your home, the utility companies, and put a smart meter, usually behind your headboard. Uh, I worry about that. I just worry about that. Um, I don't know the answer uh, to what you're asking, but I'm so lost. As I drive out to Austin and places like that, um, I can't get, if it says 5G, I can't get a signal. And yet it's supposed to make this much better. I don't get it. But there's a lot of things I don't get. I'm a guy who doesn't understand COVID-19. I'm a guy who doesn't understand why we need better. Everything is working great for me. Why did we need better? I'll never forget the interviews. Oh, this is such a good tape. Of one of our senators asking these 5G powerhouses, money guys, have you done any human studies? No. Have you done any safety studies? No. No, we're just going to put them up. And they did. And they are. So for me, I kind of like the idea there are little devices you can put in your home now, go online, that offset these huge amounts of electromagnetic fields that are coming in. That's what I've chosen to do, Bob. Good question. Why is high fructose corn syrup so bad? Linda, uh, high fructose corn syrup, because of the name corn, uh, it's a sweetener from corn. It's used in so many things today. I picked up a paleo product, or a paleo, a keto product the other day, and they use, <clears throat> they use the acronym HFCS, high fructose corn sweetener. I got to tell you, I'm, this is what's put in soda pop, and there are many studies to conclude it it's not so good. I mean, I, I would rather see people eat, oh boy, where am I going with this, cane sugar than high fructose corn syrup or corn sweeteners. I told you the other day about ethanol. So many of you wrote to me, thank you. I'm worried about our gas tanks in our cars. And I'm worried about all the, the uh, hoses that go from our carburetor and air cleaners and so forth being eaten up by ethanol, which is corn. At least we're putting it in gas tanks and not in our body so much anymore. I'm one who backed away from corn long ago, and I'm one who sat with my grandmother and grandfather and ate ears and ears and ears of corn. Remember those metal things you put in both ends of the corn and you'd, I used to love that. I don't miss corn, I miss popcorn. Um, you know, if I go to a movie, which I rarely do, but I would love a bag of popcorn. I kind of miss that. I miss pasta. Has anybody ever placed on your table in a restaurant or at home a hot loaf of bread? It seems to gravitate magnetically into my nares. Just, oh, it smells so good with melted butter on it. Um, because butter, you know, has uh, properties that are antimicrobial. Using butter on bread might be the way to go, you know? Uh, okay, I hope that helps, uh, Linda. Yeah, Betty has a great question here. 
can candida be the issue with hyperparathyroidism and high calcium? Possible considered an autoimmune issue? I think it is. Thank you. Love your shows and a firm believer in what you teach. Thank you, Betty. Betty, there's one, only one way that I know of, two ways, to conclude that hyperparathyroidism and high calcium, serum calcium, is linked to fungus. If there were a test for it. Now, there are laboratories like real life laboratory here in Dallas. I mean, they can take a blood sample and tell you in your blood serum. They spin it down and look for anti-antibodies, or they can use other test methods now. If you have been in contact with the one we talked about earlier, uh, aflatoxin B1, or any of these molds, or the mycotoxins they make, they can test for things like that. The question is, if you went on a medication then to remove, that one happens to be made, you know, by a very common mold. If you went on a medication to remove that mold uh, from your body, uh, would you improve? Would the hyperparathyroidism dissipate and the calcium levels get back to normal? The other way is much simpler, okay? Go on the Kaufman diet. Ask your doctor, since you have a medical condition, go on the Kaufman diet for a month man, you're going to know. Uh, go back to the doctor. I'd like some blood tests done here. I'd like to see what my serum calcium level is um, and see what happens. If you don't notice the real changes, ask the doctor if you can have, if you think it's candida, the best one would be Diflucan. Although candida works for other uh, molds. Thanks, John. Uh, ask the doctor if you can have Sporinox. Um, any number of antifungals. Voraconazole, V-O-R-A, Voraconazole is a newer generation antifungal. I'm kind of stuck in the 80s when I used to teach a lot about the, the you know, Lamisil and Sporinox and Diflucan that came along in the 80s. They were safer than Amphotericin B and the other antifungals. But now there's a whole new generation. Voraconazole is one of them and I hear great things about it. Eventually, I think we're going to find that many conditions that we don't know the cause of today, every medical chart probably has etiology unknown in it by an honest physician who did a physical, did lab work and said, I have no idea. Or idiopathic etiology, we, we have no idea what's causing it, okay? Um, so I might ask my doctor for some antifungals I might chase it with a Kaufman diet for a month, and then I might go back in and see where my parathyroid was and my uh, serum calcium numbers are. Look at that, the tea bag's still in there. Oh, I can never get enough of that. Thank you for allowing me that break. So Debbie says, what's best for Epstein-Barr? So as you know, it's a member of the herpes family. Epstein. I swear, you guys, one day a Dr. Epstein and a Dr. Barr moved in to adjoining offices. And they said, let's have lunch. And during lunch, they said, what'd you have today? I had two cases of mononucleosis. You know what? I had six cases of mono. Wonder what's going on. First, let's change the name. I don't like mononucleosis. Let's call it Epstein-Barr. And a new disease was born, Epstein-Barr. It's quite an honor. Tay-Sachs disease, you know, Parkinson's. It's quite an honor to have a disease named after you. Wellness, even at an old age, I hope they call Kaufmanism. You know, you can pass each other on the street, don't touch each other, but bump shoulders and say, I'm suffering from Kaufmanism. I feel great all the time. So, given that it's a virus, a doctor would introduce you to one of many antivirals, anti-inflammatories, uh, antivirals, but... I've got to tell you, um, I think underlying viri surfacing, and maybe even bacteria, there is sometimes a fungal component to it. How do I know? You probably had an Epstein-Barr titer, and it's probably 160, 1 to 160, or 320, or 640, or high. And that's how you know, Debbie, that you have it. Um, I'd try Kaufman's philosophy. Antifungal supplements or antifungal medications and one month on the Kaufman diet, go back in and get the new titer done on the Epstein-Barr test. Mononucleosis, are you better? 
This proves not that all Epstein-Barr or mononucleosis is fungal driven. I think, see these fungi wreck your immune system. Most fungi that are pathogenic to man make poisons that ruin your immune system. Oh, by the way, while it's down there, let's surface some old viruses. Did a child in third grade sneeze on you and had mononucleosis? You've been carrying around antibodies to that for years and years and years. Now it's surfaced as a symptom or a fatigue. You know where I'm going with that. Uh, so try my diet. Doesn't cost a penny. And this is the month we're home. How cool would that be if I get a note from you uh, May 1st saying, hey, I tried it, and guess what? My Epstein-Barr titer went way down. Good for you. Here's my buddy, Ann. Doug, we're keeping uh, you all covered in prayers, Healthcare workers also, I agree, as well as you and John and your families. Keeping your grandsons in prayer, sending blessings to all. It's a beautiful rainy day in the mountains. I can just picture sometimes, uh, boy, did I watch something last night on Pickers, uh, the two guys in their truck found four old Volkswagen vans, and I was like glued to that TV. I love old VWs, old Porsches, old motorcycles, and I love that show. But normally we're watching HGTV, and I can just picture Ann's house, a little cabin far from the matting crowds, up at six or 7,000 foot level. She's a dear friend, stays in touch with me all the time. Thank you, Ann, and thank you for your prayers. We need them. Oh, Bonnie, this is a good question. Good afternoon. Have you heard of collagen? I've heard it was good for pain. Yeah, we used to just think it helped rebuild. It obviously doesn't work because I've taken it. It helps rebuild all of this. But there are many studies now for collagen outside of just beauty. You know, um, I took a month's worth of, these were really good. They were gummies, collagen gummies, that one of the doctors from Life Extension was telling me about. So I bought a bottle and took it, and uh, I'm an experimenter. I experiment. Everything except estrogen, I will experiment with. And so collagen was one of them. I don't suffer from pain, so I'm a pretty lucky old guy. But, Bonnie, just Google collagen pain and watch the studies start coming up. Before, when my boys, Ruth and my boys were small, we didn't, we couldn't say, hey Siri, teach me about vaccines. We had to read. We had to go to libraries and read. Today, a mom and dad can see the benefits and perhaps some of the drawbacks. I think a mother and dad or a fiduciary, a trust-bound relationship with that child to make that decision for him or her, not a pediatrician, not the head of the CDC, a mom and dad. And it's, I think it's really the first time you hurt. You are so madly in love with this little bundle of joy. And then, obviously, you take him or her to a pediatrician. They say, okay, we're going to start uh, with shots. Okay, let us think on this. Okay, well, you guys go home. I want you back here Thursday for the first set of shots. And I think a mom and dad... Don't robotically trust, where are we going with this coronavirus? Don't robotically trust. Rather, you owe an honor responsibility to really study vaccines. I mean really. And then you owe a responsibility to that pediatrician to say yay or nay. Here's the danger. Pediatricians and doctors in general are re-socialized during their training. What that means, I was re-socialized during boot camp. Uh, you take a punk 18-year-old kid who goes behind the barn and drinks a little and smokes, and man, in boot camp, you don't do that, or you get a fist to the face. Um, doctors really had grandmas and mothers who kissed their knees when they fell down in the dirt. And miraculously, that kiss worked. Or they put a little Bactine or thimerosal, or thimerosal a little uh, mercury on it. What was that called? Uh, mer mercurochrome, John, thank you. And boom, it was done. Well, in medical school, grandma was a quack. Kisses don't take away, you know, breaks in the skin. You need sutures, and obviously if it's that deep, you do. But it's fascinating to watch the brightest of bright. 
how they change during their training. Now the cure for everything is a prescription pad or a needle. I don't think that's right, okay? I think they're very bright people, but we're learning how bright they are as an industry today, aren't we? And we're gonna learn for the next 30 days how really bright they are. Okay, good questions. Um, how do you feel about oil of oregano uh, or borax? Yeah, both, I'm very bullish. Uh, Mary, oil of oregano has been around f pizza, you know, it's been around forever. Uh, there was a guy that I used to hang out with, his name is Cass Ingram. He started a company, North American Urban Spice, he's a doctor, uh, and Cass Ingram wrote a book called The Cure is in the Cupboard. It's a spectacular book. Here's another one right here. I just found this one in the other room and brought it over. Right here, here it is. Can they see this book, Johnny? The Scientific Validation of Herbal Medicine by uh, Dr. Lowry, his name, or Maori, Dan Maori. He's a PhD. And it's forwarded by Jeff Bland, well known to all of us in this industry. Uh, folks, I paid, I got this online, I think I paid $4 for it. A wealth, get it, a wealth of information. And then ask about oregano and uh, uva ursi. The things you hear me talk about, burdock root, are, are in here. Everybody needs a book like this that's nice and cheap. It used to be $14.95, but it's the scientific validation of herbal medicine by, doc, uh, by Dr. Daniel Maori. Uh, borax, uh, yeah, antifungal, 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 antifungal. You know what's fascinating to me through the years? I do these television shows. We, it takes me a weekend to write them and then, you know, five, seven minutes to uh, uh, tape them. But I did a bunch of them the other day. Folks, when you begin to look at what's ailing America, and you begin to look at the best-selling drugs, right? Did you know that SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, kill fungus, antidepressants? I can't, do you believe that antacids have antifungal property? We've talked about this with fenbendazole or mebendazole, that antiworms have antifungal properties. Did you know that head and shoulder shampoo is antifungal? Um, did you know that statins are antifungal drugs? It amazes me when you, well, Doug, your cholesterol's, you know, 250, you need a statin drug. Or don't cry, you'll be okay, let me get you to a doctor and get you on an antifungal. Do you see where I'm going with this? Is the base of what ails us fungus? You'd be shocked at how many vitamins and minerals are antifungal. Zinc, huge antifungal. I mean, the list just goes on. Uh, B vitamins, vitamin C. It's absolutely, uh, vitamin D. God put vitamin D here with a big ball in the sky a million miles away, right? The sun. It's just amazing. And when you don't get enough, you know, you end up with all sorts of uh, health problems. Not enough vitamin C. That's why they called me 50 years ago a limey, a sailor, right? The sailor's out in the ocean. Not enough vitamin C, they end up with scurvy, skin falling off, all sorts of brain problems. So they brought in lemons and limes and gave them to the sailors and all that went away. We've forgotten all that. We've forgotten that grandma kissed our knee when we fell down. We forgot what Bactine could do. We forgot what a little love, what a hug will do. In favor of, oh, he's a doctor. He's got four more years of college than most people. He must, oh, he's a neurologist. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. We have to be very, very careful of choosing our heroes. My hero today is the nurse, the lab tech, the doctor who's sleeping in his garage on a, a, a blanket and a, uh, some kind of a mattress because he can't go in the house because he worries about his wife and his kids. Have total heroes. Been there, done that. I wrote the book on it. Those are my real heroes. But folks, you, you train someone up in one area, 
in their career and you charge him $300,000 to do it and you deprogram him or her who used to take vitamins in high school not to take them anymore, that's quackery. Only take these and oh, by the way, with that certificate, only you can get them. I don't know. Good people, twice my IQ, but they've been schooled in one area. And through all of this COVID-19, I, I think we're beginning to see that schooled is in quotes. Where are all the virologists? Where are all the professors that taught them during their medical training of what to do with a mutated virus? What do you do with it? Well, we don't know. Neither did your professors if it didn't come from a prescription pad. When you're taught to downplay the cause of a health problem in favor of treating the symptom it causes, or better yet, six symptoms. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here, Doug, I want you to go fill those. It'll be a thousand bucks. Start taking that. But wait a minute, I have chronic sinusitis. Yeah, there's an antibiotic and you know an anti-inflammatory in there. We're gonna take care of you. What I wanna know is what caused it. We don't know. Yes, we do. Well documented by the Mayo Clinic in 1999. They found fungus, six different types of fungi, I believe, growing in the ethmoid and sphenoid sinuses, and they found that the polyps in the nose had fungus in them also. That's not what your ear, nose, and throat doctor is going to tell you today. Take this drug. See, if it's a fungal problem, you can break your lease. You can move out. You can test the next apartment or house to make sure it doesn't have fungus in it. But within a few months, if it's not a deep mycosis in your lung now, you're going to be fine. Some antifungals, vitamin C, take a daily multiple, maybe more zinc, maybe caprylic acid, which hates yeast, you know. So, we're learning. <laughs> Alice, Doug, if my memory serves, you have a connection with Johns Hopkins. I actually had a couple of them who, in my understanding, is involved with the creation of COVID-19 drugs. Are they consulting you? Uh, no, it's, it's, not, it's not Johns Hopkins. Um, it's an Ohio uh, medical school. And uh, yeah, the, they're not consulting me. No, they're not consulting me, these doctors. Brilliant and a ball to talk with, an absolute ball. Where is, uh, I may have left it over at the other set. Uh, here it is, right here. Uh, Case Western Medical School out in Ohio, Cleveland, I think they are, <clears throat> has some of the brightest people. I know one or so of them personally. This is Mahmoud Ghanoum. You cannot believe this guy. He's written a medical textbook. Ooh, weighs about six pounds. He gave that to me. Antifungal therapy every page of this book. This is a $300 medical textbook. Some of you have bought this. Every page of this blows me away. Sporothrix, Sporothrix, Sporothrix shecky. Do you know where this stuff grows? It's in the soil, but it grows on rose thorns. If you prick yourself with a rose thorn and you can't breathe a few hours later, or the side of your head is getting edematous, swollen, Get to a doctor immediately. Um, this book is just, he's one of my heroes. He is overseeing, he's assisting with the development of antifungal drugs. Uh, we just had a chat and laughed the other day. I am blessed to know so many very, very bright guys. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Noletta, the amount of money being spent on this virus is astounding. And just forgive me, guys, I, I have my opinion. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But I see the numbers. First of all, I see the stats. And I brought you this right before the COVID-19 virus. The stats are in the last 10 years, according to the Center for Disease Control, that the flu shot has been from 19 to 60% accurate with a mean, a standard mean deviation. That gives you about a 40 42% accuracy. Um, 
And I'm so lost. I'm so lost. And it's killed a huge number of people. And folks, there isn't a, a counter on television when a child dies from the flu. But there is on this one. I mean, I look at it almost, it's the strangest thing to me to see a show start. Well, we've lost 23 people here in America. We're now the biggest. We're bigger than England. We're bigger than uh, London. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Italy. We're bigger than China. We've got more people sick with this. We got, and, and the numbers change. Oh, there's six more dead right there. This is just blowing my mind. It's blowing my mind at the irreverence. Number one, but the, why didn't we do that um, for the flu? Why are we doing that with this virus? Why didn't we know that a sneeze with regular flu stays on cardboard for four hours? Why do we know that with this? Who is the genius doing this? I'm just so lost. <laughs> Sorry, John. It is. It is. It's strange, John. I find it just strange. I know we're going to get through it yeah. I, because I know our president doesn't want this to go on and we don't want it to go on. I don't think God wants this to go on either. No, I totally agree, John. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, yeah, the amount of money being spent so true. If it's mandated, says Anne Marie, I like Anne Marie. If it's mandated, we all need to get up and get out and talk to politicians with our pitchforks. It's, um, it's just, things change, things change. And none of us have ever seen anything like this. Uh, so it's really a bit bizarre. It's really a bit bizarre to me, but we're gonna get through it. What kind of tea do you drink? Mint medley. And uh, it's made, mint medley made by Bigelow. Oh, it's so good. So good, Karen. How do we reverse, Jessica asks, how do we reverse type 1 diabetes? Okay. When we study mice for new diabetes drugs, it's inhumane to study humans. So you wouldn't get 100 humans with diabetes and experiment with drugs. So you give mice diabetes or bunnies or rabbits, you know, uh, rats. You give them diabetes because they don't get it. So you got to give it to them. You give it to them with two antibiotics, baflomycin and streptozotocin. These are in pharmacy. Well, they're probably not anymore. They're quite toxic. Baflomycin and streptozotocin. They're mycotoxins. They're antibiotics. So they're fungal poisons. And you uh, inject this over a period of time, and all these bunnies get diabetes. That should be, Jessica, our first clue. You're not serious, Doug. Yeah. We give them antibiotics. Oh, billions of antibiotics are handed out every day. Yeah, and diabetes is going, yeah. I'm telling you, folks, um, not having answers has been hugely profitable. I've never seen another field like this. Not having answers, just keep printing the money. So we give mice and rats diabetes with baflomycin or streptozotocin. You inoculate them over a year or so, and they all get diabetes. And then we studied the drugs. Ooh, that one clear, that drug's working pretty good because it's an antifungal drug. Oh, here we go, a new drug. And they have weird names, but the uh, zith uh, not Zithromax, I've heard so much of that drug recently, oh my gosh. Um, glitazones, Actos and Avandia, the glitazone, anti-diabetic drugs, kill fungus. Isn't this fascinating? Do you see where I'm going today? Is the etiology of COVID-19 fungus? Well, it was in old folks' homes. I should be in one of them. It's in old people's homes. Lots of mold sometimes there. We aren't letting kids go to school because they're more vulnerable. You talk about a place that has a lot of mold, what about a hospital? These are called nosocomial infections. Hospitals grow mold. What about a ship that's out in the water? Yeah, lots of mold in those rooms. Not lots of viruses, lots of mold. I'm just saying, all I want you to do is contemplate keeping yourself actively antifungal. I just went outside and sweat 
20 minutes before I came on here. Sweat a lot. It was only a 22 minute workout, but wow, did I sweat. I think that's important. I think eating greens over grains, green alkaline, grain acid. So eating a lot of greens, juicing right now, uh, apples, and you know, we're allowed to go to the grocery stores. By the way, can I, uh, I made a friend in Temple, Texas on my way to Austin. Uh, I stop at a little health food store out there. And uh, we've been going there a long time and there's never anybody in there. It's a big health food store. And we're happy that there's nobody in there because we can go in and get what we want, no lines, just walk right up. Well, a month ago on our uh, way, we stopped. And the I couldn't find a parking place. <laughs> the parking lot of a health food store that not many people knew about, so I thought, was jammed. My wife and I high-fived each other. This is really good. Um, we went in and the lady that we had befriended uh, came up to us and she said, do you believe this? We are so busy. And she said, I am loving this. It's times like these when most people who wouldn't go into a health food store are now thinking, hmm, they're saying IV vitamin C might really help the coronavirus. I wonder if we should get some oral vitamin C. By the by, great idea great idea and take it a gram half a gram to a gram you know throughout the day instead of 10 grams don't do that but instead of a bunch at once and I looked at the people and I just had the biggest smile on my face if this is what it's gonna take for the paradigm to shift from standing in line for a flu shot or a physical exam or making that darn doctor he can't see me for two months for my physical exam to that, I'm all for it. I am in with both feet. I am thrilled that people are going into health food stores. I hope they have a wonderful experience. I hope the checker outers treat them good. Um, I hope they come back because these people are going to eat that kale. They've only read about it or seen it in a magazine. Ugh, that looks horrible. It looks like eating a plant. They're going to read about what's really in a cucumber or celery or a head of cabbage, right? It's unbelievable. They're going to start eating their vitamins and minerals and amino acids and good, clean meat. And they're going to start feeling different. Not all of them, but many of them are going to become customers. And folks, we're creating a paradigm. May I just land today by telling you how proud I am of the people that are feeding the truckers, that are seeing to it that the doctors have a hot cup of tea as they exit the hospital. We're proving what we were all about all along. We are strong, we're united, and I think if we can stay indoors and let this pandemic pass, I think a month from now everything's going to be different. My only worry is that one year from now we're going to go back to being lined up for mass vaccination. It's my worry. Okay. God bless you guys. I'll see you Thursday and I'll answer some of these questions Thursday and some tonight at home. Take care. Bye-bye.